You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome to a special episode of Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and technology. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, an 18-person music and technology PR firm. This is a special edition of the Music Tectonics podcast because it's the first report out from our first annual Music Tectonics conference, which took place October 28th and 29th, 2019 in Los Angeles. You're about to hear one of the brightest minds in music technology and the future of the music industry, Mark Mulligan of Media Research. He'll give you the latest thoughts on trends in the music industry and where he thinks we should be focusing our attention to succeed in music and tech. You'll hear how we are at the peak of the attention economy, so every innovation in media from here on out will take attention away from something else. You will hear that we are at the end of the mainstream era, where massive stars created cultural moments shared by all, and we are moving into an era of amassing multiple niches to build up big audiences. You'll hear about how self-empowered artists will continue to shift the power dynamics of the music industry, even for labels, and about how publishers are shifting their rights ownership now that it is clear that royalties from masters will continue to get a bigger piece of the streaming pie. Mark also says that streaming is about to plateau, and you'll hear what four options he sees for moving forward when that happens. And this all builds to what he thinks will be the secret sauce of the next music gold rush, how to make money from fandom, not streaming. Before I unleash the amazing opening keynote from Mark Mulligan of Media Research, I need to give you a little context in case you are not with us at the conference because Mark refers to it in his speech. On Monday morning at 3 a.m., the day of our pre-conference in L.A., my phone started blowing up with text messages from my team of 11. A wildfire broke out on the west side of L.A. in both the hotel where our team was staying and the Skirball Cultural Center, where we had planned to hold our main conference, were in the evacuation zone of what was being called the Getty Fire. Luckily, our Monday pre-conference was booked elsewhere in downtown LA, far from the fires, but while running the pre-conference, we had to decide what to do about the nearby wildfire and the fact that our main Tuesday venue was closed. Suffice it to say that my crack team, shout out to Bethany, Shaylee, Cheryl, Eleanor, and the whole Rock, Paper, Scissors gang, were decisive about not canceling the conference and instead, instead stayed determined on finding another venue. My team landed on the Sheraton Grand in downtown LA, and we walked in at 9 p.m. that Monday night, only several hours before the keynote you're about to hear on this episode, and saw the hotel had already had the rooms set up for our conference that they had just heard about a few hours earlier. I was elated. The new venue is located, I kid you not, at 711 Hope Street. That's the kind of conference we had, and if you missed it, don't worry, we're coming back in 2020. Subscribe to the podcast to find out when we announce our dates. And one last note before we jump in, you will hear Mark Mulligan mention the Seismic Shift trading cards in his keynote. You can learn more about those at musictectonics.com slash seismic shifts. But suffice it to say that one of those trading cards is called Music Like Water, which is not a concept I invented, and another is ironically called Music Like Fire, which Mark says is exactly what you need to be thinking about for building audiences for artists and recordings these days. Without further ado, here is the opening keynote of the first annual 2019 Music Tectonics Conference with Mark Mulligan in downtown Los Angeles. A lot of my inspiration on the seismic shift trading cards and on the podcast come from my biggest inspiration in music technology. Please welcome, all the way from London, England, from Media Research, Mark Mulligan. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, one of the golden rules they say about doing a, uh, do, doing a speech is what you do is you start with an anecdote about sort of your journey there or something, something to sort of break the ice. And, and they say, you know, make it funny and don't make it political. Um, I'm actually going to break both of those rules. So we'll be very quickly, we've all been, you know, it's an amazing job that r these guys did, managing to find another venue because of the fires. The fires are more than just an inconvenience. We're facing a climate crisis at the moment. Our climate is changing around us. Our built environment is changing the climate around us. If you take one non-music thing away from your experience here, is look at those fires and use them to get a sense of the urgency that exists at the moment about our need to reverse the damage which has been done to the environment. So apologies for that. I needed to say it. Moving back on to <coughs> music. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do. I'm going to try to get through in the next 40 minutes. 
not everything that you need to know about, but I'm going to touch on a lot of different bases about what's going on in the wider music business at the moment. And I'm intentionally going to take a wide view rather than a deep view. I want to sort of leave you with things to make you think and contextualize a lot of the conversations which will happen throughout today. The first thing I'm going to do is walk through some meta trends, and maybe this is one of the most important things, is that now everything is interconnected. No media industry exists in a vacuum. Every media industry is dependent and interdependent on others, even if they don't realize it. So I'm going to walk through just how that is. Then on to what's changed over the last few years, looking at some consumption patterns, then some industry shifts, and finally a bit of what, what comes next, and sort of give some pointers about maybe not where things will go, but where things should go. So meta trends, they've... <coughs> As much as I'm somebody who likes to look forward, I'm also a huge history buff, so I always like to look back and see what we can learn from history. This guy is John Philip Sousa. Does anybody in the room know who John Philip Sousa is? Good. Well, I normally only get one or two hands. So, inventor of the Sousaphone, but he was also at his time, he was, he was like Kanye and, uh, and Jay-Z and everyone all rolled into one. He was, you know, he was the biggest popular music act he was, uh, you know, he composed, he, uh, he performed, he, he arranged, he choreographed. But his kind of music was military marching music. Military marching music at the turn of last century was the most popular music in the US. He happened to be there at the same time as we had Edison creating the phonograph. Now, we are all here in this room because the recorded music business exists. The recorded music business is a tiny blip in the history of music. And there was a beautiful quote, which is somebody, you know, at the, the time the phonograph was coming around, who's, who's, you know, people really didn't like the idea of it at the time. And this person said, it's a machine for bringing dead sounds back to life. Now, if you think about that, until we had recordings, music would never sound the same twice. And you could only hear that music if you were fortunate enough to be where somebody was performing it. It could only exist in the moment. And that's why music changed and it was fluid. You know, and particularly popular, mu popular music, which tended not to be written down as much. And so music was this very fluid concept. Then along came the gramophone and it started setting it into stone. So one of the things I'm going to talk about later on is how maybe it's time to start turning the clock back on that ossification of music. But here, you know, the, he is talking about how he sees the world is getting, the music world is getting destroyed by this newfangled technology. And you, know, you can hear the indignation in his voice. Um, thankfully, he was wrong, because if he wasn't, then we'd all be listening to playlists of military marching music now. But there's a really important principle here. You know, if you just swapped a few words, it's exactly the same way that people who are you know, concerned about how streaming is changing the way that the music business works. And this is because fundamentally, change is difficult. Now, you know, change is difficult is one of those horrible phrases a management consultancy firm will come in before they tell you that you're fired. But it really is genuinely difficult because we don't know the whole thing about change is we don't know what is going to happen. We can have some good ideas and we can have some hopes and expectations. We're at a stage with music now where we've got great return to growth but we've also got on the consumer side of the music business a real slowdown in innovation and if you look at the streaming market it's essentially like everybody's got to buy a Lexus but they can choose what color paint they have you know and that is a really sad testament that we're in a point where if you look in games you look in video you see so much innovation so much change, so much segmentation, you know, niche services and interactivity and all these sort of things which we do not have enough of at the moment in music. So that's one of the things we're going to be talking about as we go through this. Um, the other big bit is we are at peak in the attention economy. So the attention economy is we, we essentially spend three currencies when we spend our time digitally. One is money if we're paying for something. Two is our data. So if we're using Facebook or Instagram, and, that, and the third is our attention. 
The attention economy is what has empowered and driven everything that's happening in the digital world. But we've reached peak. You know, we've got to the stage where there aren't many hours left. That's why Reed Hastings of Netflix said his biggest enemy was sleep, because he was literally needed to find more time to make people spend time with Netflix. My favourite stat of the entire digital era was from, of all places, the Swedish Office for Statistics, where they did a media cannibalisation study, seeing what things have been impacted most by digital. And the one activity most cannibalised was staring out of the window. You know, and it's that dead time and that time of reflection that's gone. And so when we first got phones, and we didn't really have exactly what we wanted, so, well, there were loads of game apps, so we all started playing Candy Crush Saga and Clash of Clans. Now as we've reached peak in the attention economy, games have become the canary in the mind for what happens next. In our data tracking, we track a whole bunch of things every quarter. For about a year and a half now, mobile gaming penetration has declined every single quarter because people are using that time to do the things they actually want to do. They can actually watch the shows they want to watch. They can actually listen to the music they want to listen to. And so this is a meta trend which affects music. You probably hear a lot about talk about the share of ear, you know, how much time streaming is taken from radio, etc. That is a little sideshow. What we should be worried about is how much share of overall media consumption audio is competing for. So in peak attention, the digital economy has been driven by growing consumption. That consumption is now reaching peak. So growth is going to come at the expense of others. Any minute gained by anyone is taking a minute away from someone else. Games have been the early victims, but more will follow. Okay, and you'll, you'll notice I do a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt here, so I'm going to take you on a narrative. I'm going to sort of batter you down and then start building you back up. <clears throat> so what's changed? So Dimitri is talking about music's like water. Why is there a cat in here? Because why not have a cat? Yes, music is like water, but that's not a good thing. How many of us go out when we're out having, you know, having drinks with our friends, talk about, Got this amazing water coming out of my tap. You know, water is a utility. It's just something that's there. And that's what we've done with digital music. We've turned music into utility. Yes, it's a valued utility. We value water. I mean, if the water's not there, then we notice it's not there and we've got a problem. But it's not something that fills us with passion, which is what music is meant to do. And so we're at a stage where we've got a real opportunity to work out how we can bring back the fandom and the passion into music. If you look back throughout history, music used to be the central cultural identifier for youth. So much so you could tell what pe music people liked by how they looked. You know, the teddy boys in the 50s and then the mods, punks, metalheads, new romantics, indie kids. You could tell people were saying, this is me. Music matters so much to me, I'm going to decide what hair I've got, what clothes I've got, because I want to tell you <clears throat> what music matters to me. Now, with so many things competing for time, all of these other things are just as likely for youth to define who they are. A 12-year-old is more likely to define themselves as a fan of Ninja than they are of any music act. And with everything, when we're looking at what's happening to younger consumers, you always have to work out what is cohort-based versus what is demographic-based. So what are the things that they're doing just because they're young and these things happen to be here now? And what of them are permanent new behaviours that they're going to take with them? I would argue that on Fortnite, a 12-year-old spending $10, $20 a month on skins and emotes that do nothing to improve the gameplay but say everything about the identity of who they are, that is something that they're going to take with them. And at the moment, we don't have an answer for that in music. So that money's going to go somewhere else as they grow up, unless we work out a plan B. <clears throat> the music business has also dramatically changed. We all know that we've gone from a distribution model to an access model, but we're also seeing that hits are getting smaller. So what we're looking at here 
There's a number of albums that sold 20 million or more. And so for more recent years, this includes um, album equivalent streams, etc. We're not just in a post-sales era, we're in a post-mainstream era as well. So what do I mean by that? Well, in the old model, if you were going to build up an artist, what you would do, you'd get them all the big TV shows, you'd pay radio pluggers to make sure everybody heard them on the radio, you'd have nice big billboards, you would turn them into a household brand. Now, that's great. You created global stars like Beyonce. But the problem with making everyone in the household know about that artist is not everybody in the household will like the artist. So you've wasted a lot of spend. Worse than that, if they really don't like the music, you've gone and got people to be anti-fans of the artist. But you had cultural movements, cultural moments, rather. You know, and it was like it was music's equivalent to the water cooler moment. Now, we're moving into an era where we've got a multiplicity of niches where you don't need to use radio or TV in the same way. And in fact, you're not going to get the same hit from TV and radio because audiences are fragmenting and people are spending less time watching and listening to broadcast. And it's also a lot of really expensive, wasted marketing budget if you're trying to get them onto all the big mass media. Instead, what you can do is you can find the exact audience for your, for your artist and reach them with self-serve marketing tools by Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat, etc. And what you do is you build up a whole bunch of niches. So you might have in the old model say, we're going to get 5 million fans in this one country. Now what you might do is you get 5 million fans across 20 countries. It's still 5 million fans, but they fly below the radar in each of those countries. So you get artists like, like Awol's Lauv, who's below the mainstream, but has 3 billion streams to his name. This is what the future of music marketing and artist success is going to be. Now, in any transition, and we're still in a transition, you know, we've still got a huge number of people who listen to the radio, a huge number of people who buy CDs, we've still got a huge number of people who sit in and just turn the TV set to see what's on. In any transition, the old and the new coexist for a long period of time. And what that means is you will always find numbers and statistics to tell whatever story you want to tell. So you can have a statistic saying, look, radio is listened to by more people than streaming is. True. But which is declining and which is growing, clearly it's streaming. So you have to be really selective and, and discerning about which numbers you're going to use. Look at the direction of travel more than the size of the installed base. The other thing that's happened in this period is <clears throat> what we're looking at here is the biggest, the top selling albums of the decade. Now this is a tiny little sample size and there's a whole bunch of skews, but nonetheless, there's still an interesting story, which is in the heyday, of music sales. You had albums which genuinely represented the music culture of the time. Once we started going beyond the peak, it's the bloody Beatles, the biggest selling album of the 2000s. And then we move on to Adele. Yes, an amazing artist, but clearly one which ticks the old boxes of what artists used to be. And then we have Drake, who is Huge in today's standards, but compared to all of those, a fraction of the amount of scale because we're moving in, into this era of fragmented fandom. And if you look in the 2000s, the, among the top five albums, about three of them were greatest hits of artists from yesterday, yesteryear. And that's because music buyers were getting older because younger people weren't buying anymore. <coughs> this, very quickly, and I'm, I'm not going, there's going to be a lot of data coming up soon, Say to you, don't look at every single number. You'll go crazy. Just look, you know, I'm using data here to tell you a story. This is from our artist tracker, where we track a whole bunch of artists every quarter across a whole bunch of metrics. This is looking at two of those metrics, the top rankings for those listened to overall, and then those streamed overall. And bear in mind, this is the top 15, so this is going to skew to the big ones, right? And when you get below the top 15, everything fragments, and you see massive differences. But even in the top 15 you see really different rankings in those which are, you know, what people are listening to overall versus what people are streaming. And we see the top five overall listened to artists are ones who've all featured in big movies. And this is the interconnectedness of media that I was referring to at the start. And this will be, 
the fire card of Dimitri's pack, which is now, in order to reach big audiences, you have to go beyond where music used to be. You have to create new context for it. We're in an era where catalog sales are going through an existential crisis, and that's crucial for any label, any big label that relies upon catalog revenue to invest in the next generation of artists. The way catalog used to work was sell somebody an album of songs they've already got to make them remember what it was like to be young. That doesn't work the same anymore. People are going to do that. They'll listen to the five songs they like the most on a playlist and listen to them once or twice. You know, and maybe generate a few cents of revenue instead of $10 worth of revenue. So you have to create new context. You have to make the music exist for a new generation. And that's what those movies have done, is they've taken the music and given it current cultural relevance. When we saw the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack, the kids who listened to that music, they weren't thinking this is music from 30 years ago. I was just thinking, great, this is music to my favorite film. So there are many things which are changing. One of them is you can no longer take it for granted just because an artist is big that people are going to rush out and go and you know, listen to the music all over again. One other bit which is cr really important here is when I was talking about fragmented fandom, if we were to look at that, those rankings as a percentage of people who are aware of the artist, then we see a completely different ranking. We start seeing all the Post Malones, etc., absolutely dominating the charts. What you've got is younger artists with younger fan bases who are predominantly streaming. They don't need to be known by everyone. And those people who do know them, who've been reached with the right marketing, they become much more likely to be fans. And so you see a really high ratio between awareness and fandom. <coughs> right, so on to some consumption patterns. Uh, I could just go through the next three slides and go, data, 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 but let me just very quickly, this is just to, you probably already know a lot of this stuff, but it's just to, to remind you of it. So this is looking at the first half of 2019, globally, music subscriber numbers and the revenue generated by them, and what do we see? The, the, the headline story is we have a few services dominating the global picture. And beyond that, even within these, which are the biggest, the, the sad thing is Pandora, Melon, Tencent, each of those only exist in one country. So really, when you strip them out of it, you see you go from head, no body, straight to the long tail. Now, we've got this incredibly consolid consolidated streaming market. Uh, it's probably not going to be a winner-takes-all, but Spotify is the only global streaming service of scale that has to worry about paying its bills through music. All those other players there are using music to sell you something else. And that's a really important consideration when we think about, when we talk about the sustainability of streaming economics. There's only one company who's really worried about it. And if anything, it's actually an incentive for Amazon and Apple and Google to go to rights holders and say, sure, okay, we'll pay you more. Because they can afford to pay more, because they don't have to worry about making a profit from music. And they'd all love to have a Spotify-free world. And Spotify has played this crucially important role in driving the market. So this is looking at Spotify's subscribers and overall streaming revenues here in the US. Now, it's a really nice correlated line. It does not mean that Spotify created all of this. It got its timing really well. But it absolutely was and is a market catalyst. You know, Spotify is had pretty much the same market share globally for about two years now, give or take a percentage of point or two. So you think about how heavily Amazon and Apple have been competing in that time and increasing market share. Spotify's always managed to stay slightly ahead of the pack. That won't last forever. And as Spotify focuses more and more on podcasts, it's probably going to start lessening its focus on music, but not in any major degree anytime soon. This is some of our consumer data. Again, ignore all the little bits. The key thing here is everything is fragmented. Whether you look at the places people listen, you look at the things they do. In this room, we are not a representative sample. Most of us will use streaming services a lot and listen on our phone a lot. But the rest of the world does a lot of different things. You know, a huge number of people still don't listen much on the phone. And that's an opportunity Amazon's going after heavily. People still listen to CDs a lot. You know, we've got pretty much the same share of people still listening to CDs as paying for music subscriptions. 
That's a point I was making about the old and the new worlds coexisting alongside each other. When we look at the active users of streaming services, and this is weekly active users and daily active users, again, it's really fragmented beyond the top few. One interesting little aside here, look, Apple comes forth. Apple is ahead of Amazon in subscriber numbers, but it's behind Amazon in terms of active users. And that's a bit counterintuitive, right? Because the whole thing about Amazon, it engages the more casual, less tech-savvy, older music fan. But hook them up with an Echo, and you start creating this increase in consumption, this really casual, frictionless music consumption. So, yes, yeah, that's interesting, but the number one thing here is the world is fragmented. And all alongside this, radio is finding itself struggling. Radio has had its younger audience taken away from it by streaming, and it's beginning to have its older audience taken away from it by podcasts. So what, you know, we could end up with radio being not a lot more than sports and news and weather. So radio is going through an existential crisis. Podcasts are like a Netflix moment for radio. They're creating a renaissance in terms of creativity. They're completely ripping apart the format. They're completely transforming what audio can be. So in the same way TV used to be defined by this square box we used to have it coming out of, radio used to be defined by this small box that it came out of. As soon as you take it out of its old platform, you get this amazing creativity happening. And that's a really nice contrast to the lack of creativity in the commercial side of consumer services and digital music. Streaming is doing its utmost best to try to compete with radio. I mean, what essentially streaming has done is taken the world's most valuable music buyers and turned them into radio listeners. You know, it's given them all these different ways to have lean back experiences. But again, it's fragmentation. There is no one thing that stands out in the way that binge watching stands out for video. So you can look at this either way. You could one say, well, there is no killer use case. But the other way, you could say streaming has done an amazing job of accidentally or deliberately finding a way to segment its audience. Only 10% of people do all of these things. So streaming has, again, by accident or intent, has understood that fragmentation is the nature of the game and you've got to serve all your different segments in very distinct ways. So if you're trying to market an artist, just getting them on a curated playlist is just one tiny part of the way that audiences are listening to music. So what perhaps comes next from this, you're all capable of reading, so I'm not going to go through all of those. The one thing I will talk about is voice. You'll hear a huge amount of people saying how voice is going to be the future of music. Yes, voice is going to be a really important part of the future, but it's not, it's not a format. People talk about it as if it's someone's format. It's just another interface. It's another way of getting music to play. So yes, it's going to be transformative, but don't try to overimagine what it can do. Right, so on to some industry shifts. I'm going to try to start wrapping this up soon. A uh, couple of logos of companies here. Really big shift, perhaps the most interesting shift of all that's happened within music is the rise of the empowered independent artist. I would argue that when this has run its course, this is going to be a seismic shift far bigger than streaming. You know, this is where we're getting a generation of artists coming through who are realizing they can do things on their terms, that they can have control, that they can go into deals with their eyes wide open. And if they can't get those deals, they can still have meaningful careers by using all of the tools around them, being able to reach those niches across the globe. So I've put this as a funnel because you do get artists who start at the, the so it's a funnel, so the top and work their way through to the bottom. A lot of companies are trying to fish upstream. So CD Baby, obviously purchased by Downtown. That gives Downtown a great opportunity to try to, you know, to, to fish upstream as well as just monetizing that part of the funnel. But nobody yet, including Cobalt and AWOL, nobody has yet worked out really how to properly migrate people from, from the funnel and work out to migrate them up and down really quickly. Because the song can blow up. The old model is song blows up, get them signed to a three, three album deal. They, not only might they not have three albums in them, they might not have three songs in them. 
You know, Johnny Cash said, everybody's got a certain number of songs in them. And when you've written your last song, you've written your last song. It doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to write another good song. So those 3.7 million artists at the top of the funnel, a lot of them may only have one song in them. So we've got to work out ways to be able to make them prosper for that one song rather than tying them to these old strictures that gets them creating substandard music that nobody will listen to afterwards. The other interesting bit is you're seeing a lot of new types of music companies emerging. And one of the really interesting spaces is music publishers. So there's a huge amount of money flowing into music publishing where people are investing large amounts of money to get into catalogues. So going back to 2010, $6.5 billion has been invested in publicly announced deals. You know, for the music publishing industry that's worth about $4.5 billion per year, you get a sense of the scale. Now, is it a heated market? Is there a bubble that's going to burst? Yes, at some stage, but we've got a good amount of distance in it yet. Music publishing gets... A, you, any music publisher will tell you that they don't feel that they get enough, particularly from streaming, in terms of their share. You know, and to simplify things heavily, songwriter royalties, around about 15% of streaming, label royalties, somewhere between 50 and 55%. And yes, we've seen gradual increases, but it's not going to go 50-50 anytime soon. So a lot of these music publishers are realizing, well, you know what? We know streaming is going to become the majority of our revenues within five, six years from now. Rather than just participate in a tiny bit of this, why don't we just reverse into the recordings business and we'll start competing in that side of the equation as well. And in doing so, they're looking at it in a completely different way than traditional labels have looked at it. And they're creating completely new structures which are really full stack in a strategic sense, if not always in a tech sense. So keep, there's a whole bunch of other companies I could have listed here. This is going to be, you couple this with the rise of em empowered independent artists, we're seeing the fault lines of the recordings business changing. And being an independent artist, what does independent even mean? You can be an independent artist signed to a, a major record label. You can be an independent artist who's releasing directly yourself. You can be an independent artist on a label services deal with the next generation company. So in many ways, independence is a state of mind. Independence is about artists doing things on their terms, going for the deal structures they want, and making sure that they're going into, again, as I said before, with, these, with their eyes wide open. The really positive bit is they come as empowered business partners. They're coming and saying, okay, well, look, I'm, it's my money here that's getting spent often on the marketing campaign. You know what? We're not going to waste it on those radio pluggers. I'm going to spend it this way instead. You get a much greater sense of responsibility and ownership from artists. And so, uh, and apologies for, for record labels in, in the room, if we take the old way of record label deals, was essentially indentured labor. You know, I used to have a label deal, and my, my contract said on it, I signed away my rights in the known universe and beyond. <laughs> uh, and they, you know, this is those sort of relationships, that's how the old world worked. And it's still a lot of the world still works like that. Now, when we move to label services and joint ventures and co-ownership, what we end up with is more of, a, more of an agency relationship, a client-agency relationship, and that is an entirely positive thing. But it gets really confusing. You know, and this is just a selection here of all the different types of apps and services that an artist can create their own virtual label, a label as a service. But this is actually a massive opportunity for traditional labels because the bit which you cannot invent with an app is the human touch. Now, you talk to any artist who signs a record deal, they're not signing it because of what great data they can see in the app or the transparency or, you know, even speed of reporting. They're paying because somebody at that label believed in them and believed in their music and that they thought they were going to go on that journey together. So this is a real opportunity for labels to say, what we do, whether it's a next generation label, whether it's a, uh, an artist services company, the human touch is crucial. So to finish off, what comes next? This is pretty much what most artists' fan bases look like. <coughs> and um, though these don't add up to 100, that's not deliberate. I didn't get a chance to change the slides. So I was, 
But roughly speaking, you have a small number of people who will do everything. They'll be the front of the gig, they'll buy your t-shirt, they'll buy the limited vinyl edition, they'll be getting everybody to stream your songs, and every artist, the most mainstream of artists through to the most niche and left field of artists, have that dedicated set of music aficionados. And then you have your broader fans, and they're the ones who, at scale, you'll rely on for, you know, for a huge amount of your revenue. And then you've got the passive massive, you know, the people who will hear it occasionally. The passive ma massive is going to get smaller and smaller as people are not going to hear as much music that isn't right for them. As people don't listen to broadcast and linear as much, People are going to hear more and more just what the music is right for them. So why am I saying all of this? Well, actually, fandom is potentially the most important ingredient of what comes next. If we look to the East, particularly China, but also a bit of Japan and especially South Korea, we see that music there isn't monetizing consumption like it is in the West. It's monetizing fandom. Now, so when we look at the app, say, if you look at Tencent Music, which is listed here on the NYSE, listed as a music company, but music is a minority of its revenues. The majority of its revenues are coming from live streaming and from virtual gifts and virtual currencies. People will tip and gift their favorite artists. You can buy an extra VIP package to get virtual gifts that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. TikTok and Musical.ly, which, you know, TikTok, no coincidence, has also come out of China. The Chinese music industry is essentially being invented from scratch. Because of the oxymoronically titled Cultural Revolution, you didn't have popular culture in China. So it's only over the last couple of decades or so you started to have it created from scratch. Now, if we were starting the Western music business today, there's no way we wouldn't put social at the center of it. And that's what the Chinese music industry has been able to do. Is say, Social is everything about how people express who they are. So if you remember back at that slide showing you the teddy boys and punks, etc., when music was the only central cultural reference point, you, you could take it for granted. You weren't competing with TikTok. You weren't competing with Fortnite. Now, where there's so many different ways for people to identify themselves who they are, the best chance of getting themselves to identify through music is let them incorporate it with all those other things. So TikTok is not a music app but music runs through it. It's like digital peacock, you know, the bird that spreads out its big feathers to show off who they are. That's what Instagram has enabled, it's what social across the board has enabled. TikTok is one of those few apps which is enabling, and I know there are others in the room here, but it is enabling people to express themselves through music. It's, now, TikTok hasn't worked out to monetize fandom yet, but all of those other companies, you know, from Kuo and Kugo and WeSing, they are learning how to monetize fandom. Fandom is the new currency. Now, this might sound a bit counterintuitive, but in some ways, streaming is becoming a dead end. Not for revenue. Revenue is still growing strongly, yet it's going to slow down sometime soon, probably towards the, the fourth quarter here in the US. But it's more about what you do as an artist and a label building your artist. So you put all of this money into going to marketing an artist, and well, yeah, you get them to stream a song. And if you're really lucky, they might add that song to a collection. If you're super lucky, they'll add two or three songs to a collection. But then what? Where does the building the fan base happen? Where does the, the ongoing relationship with that artist and the fan happen? Even all the places where the fans can actually engage, well, where are they? Facebook. Well, everybody knows that Facebook, you know, any fan just knows Facebook is not a place where you're talking to the artist. You're talking to the artist management company or the label, and it's essentially a whole bunch of posts trying to get you to buy something. Instagram, particularly in the post-fire festival world, we know is not a real reflection of, of the real world. So where is the authentic place where an artist and a fan can actually engage? There are a bunch of niche apps out there but there is no mainstream way yet where those artists and fans can interact. So if streaming is a dead end, where can we go next? There are four options. One, things carry on as they are, the most likely thing that's going to happen, unless we start doing something different. Two, the off-portal opportunity. So some of the labels are talking about, well, actually, we're the ones who should own the relationship with the fans. We're going to build our own destination. We're going to hold a bunch of stuff back, and, we're going to, and this will start happening. Right, so this is going to happen. Is it going to be successful? I'd argue not. But nonetheless, 
The off-portal opportunity is one thing. Tweet streaming get social. You'll have guessed by now that that's my bet. Or something new replaces streaming. If you look at 20 years ago, 1999, music revenues were going like this. We only had one format, and there was no sign of a successor. Fast forward to now, music revenue is going like this. We've only got one format, and there's no successor. Now, I'm not saying we're about to go into another 20 years of decline, but we do need there to be something else. So, if you're not in a position to be reshaping the music business, reshaping the technology landscape, and you're more, you know, what can an artist do? Well, an artist has to learn to bend the rules that exist. And that means writing and producing for the medium. You know, if your fan base is 12, 13, 14 years old, then you need for it to work to TikTok. And working on TikTok does not mean, oh, let's just put a nine-second clip of my song there and help they'll go and stream it on, on Spotify, because a whole bunch of those people are only going to hear your song in TikTok. So what you want to do is you want to make your song nine seconds that creates the best memes that can possibly exist. And that is your destination. That's what you're trying to achieve. Now, does every artist want to do that? Of course not. That is why you create for the medium where you're going to be consumed. Ditch the album or evolve the album. It's crazy how we haven't evolved the album yet. Why are we still putting out 14 songs in a linear fashion all at once? Now, yeah, we had to do it when we had a shiny disc. There's no reason at all that has to be the case anymore. And what's really encouraging, we're getting a generation of young artists coming through now saying, I can't write an album. I've not grown up listening to albums. I just write songs. So, again, it's probably going to be the artists which are going to be driving the change here. And the last bit... Fill the space between recorded and live. And this goes right back to where I started. If we say that recorded is bringing dead sounds back to life. And we've got live, and yet yeah, everybody's trying to work out how can you bring live into a digital experience, and it's never really worked. What is something that sits between the two of those? Something where you might be creating something on the fly with a small group of an audience, maybe you've got ways that that audience can lean forward and interact, whatever it might be, that is an area for experimentation and innovation. So to finish, going back in history, this is here, back in the 1850s, the California Gold Rush. The first man to make a million dollars in the California Gold Rush was this guy. And what happened? His neighbor discovered gold, and the first thing he did, he ran down to his local bar and told everybody, my neighbor's discovered gold. Now, I don't know about you, if my neighbor discovered gold, I'd be digging quietly. He did it, Samuel Brannan did it because he had a shop that sold picks and shovels. The first man to make a million dollars from the gold rush was selling picks and shovels. Then along came this guy. He of Stanford University built a train line to bring everybody west to be able to go and mine. And somebody made this really nice durable clothing that miners could wear. And so the moral of the story is if there's a gold rush, you want to be selling shovels. And so how does this tie to music? I would say if consumption, the 9.99 subscription is the gold, then fandom is the picks and shovels. And then, to go all Ned Stark on you, a recession is coming. This is not an if, it's a when. We've got a number of think tanks and even some big banks are already thinking we're already in a recession. Now think about what happens in a recession. Discretionary spending gets hit. If you've got your pay TV... And you think, okay, I'm definitely going to cut that now. And you find out, oh, actually, there's an early cancellation clause. Ah, Spotify, though, no hit for cancelling. And guess what? I can still listen to Spotify when I'm not paying for it. And there's YouTube there as well. Subscriptions are likely to be hit really hard. Live is probably going to be hit really hard as well. So start planning for recession-proof products. Points to ponder. There isn't a plan B at the moment for streaming. But streaming's not about to go anywhere. We're not in 1999. The industry is not about to collapse, but we do need something else to rejuvenate it. Music businesses are transforming, driven by independent artists and driven by new types of music companies. And fandom may just be tomorrow's currency. Thank you very much.
Thank you for listening to this special episode of the Music Tectonics podcast with a recording from the Music Tectonics conference, which took place October 2019 in Los Angeles. To keep apprised of other recordings from the conference and our upcoming 2020 dates for the conference, please hit subscribe to your favorite podcast app. I'd like to send a special thank you to our supernova sponsors of the Music Tectonics conference, AdRev, CD Baby, and Hydric, and to our star sponsors, Lyric Find and Hyper Wallet. And to everybody who came out and made the first conference a great success, check out the Seismic Shift trading cards on our website. And if you go to musictectonics.com, sign up for our newsletter where you can keep apprised of upcoming podcast episodes, blog posts, and other events we're doing. Thanks for listening. You're listening to Music Tectonics.